continue to talk through a series today called Dare to Care. And um, one of the favorite things that um, my wife and I enjoy is some conversation. And I got to tell you, my wife loves it when she asks me a question like, how have you been? How are you doing? And I say, good. She loves that. She loves that. So with all that's going on, you're doing what? Good. And if I leave it there, it's not enough. And um, the truth is, I don't mind at the right time kind of going a little bit into emotion and experience, right? But most people kind of mix it up and mix around in some level of small talk. Uh, For most people, I think small talk is a kind of unnatural learned skill, right? Uh, How many of you would say that you prefer small talk? Anybody prefer small talk? You're at a wedding reception and you're sitting with people for three hours and you just prefer to keep keep it on the surface. Anybody? Wow, all these big talkers in here did not know that. Church lobby talk, right? How's it going? Good, good. You? Kids? Good? Yep, everything's great. Really? really. Popeye's right down the street. See you you there. Most of the time, right? It's kind of natural and normal uh, to kind of work through small talk. When you're a small talker, you have to stay on the surface, and you tend to exchange information, and you tend to talk about events, things that actually happened. Um, uh, I function more naturally and normally in a different space, just going a little under the surface and having a more serious conversation, or at times having aversion to small talk, right? When there's a lot going on in someone's life, there's a lot going on in the world, and then kind of feel trapped or stuck when you just stay on what's happening and, and uh, kind of reporting some of the detail. And um, it's, it's for a lot of people, it's a little bit scary to leave that space, and get down into real emotion and real experience. Um, However, I want you to think about this. If we are to cultivate meaningful relationships with people, we really want to know the heart, and the heart isn't on the surface, and it's not discovered in small talk. And the truth is that um, if we want to take an interest in advancing beyond the routine conversations or below the surface or into the heart space with people, we do so because we're forced there if we really want to help people. Let me say that again. If we really want to help people, it's going to force us below the surface and beyond small talk, right? And We're going to talk today about getting kind of a, um, maybe a little clearer guide as to how to navigate below the surface. Maybe talk about what's going on below the surface. And we're going to focus on a topic today. So we're not primarily going to kind of do an exposition of the scripture text or what was taught, but we're going to kind of topically cover what does God reveal to us about the human heart, about what's happening under the surface, in hopes that by learning more about what God tells us about what's happening under the surface, we can actually get down there and help people, care for people, and maybe even cultivate some more meaningful relationships with people. Here's the main idea today, that if you know the heart, you know the person. And obviously, if you want to know the person, you would have to know the heart. One and the same thing. Knowing the person means knowing the heart. And don't forget that at the very beginning, the first thing that God said that wasn't good, do you remember what that was? God said, this is not good. I created and all the things I created are good, but now I'm looking at Adam, and Adam is here living life by himself, and it's not good. Everybody knows that God fixed the man by sending him a wife, right? Everybody knows that. It's not good. It's not good to be alone. Aloneness isn't good. Staying on the surface and hiding is not the good. So knowing and being known is the way that God designed us. I want you to try to let that sink in for a second if you could. Knowing someone, person, human being who God created below the surface and being known by somebody is not something that people who are reckless do or people who are needy do. It's not something that people who are mature do. It's what human beings do. 
human beings created in the image of God, and God created himself to reveal who he is, to know you and be known by you, and he's made us in our image, and therefore we know this, that it is the way that God designed us. But the heart can be veiled, right? The heart can be difficult to know, especially if someone is actively, even subconsciously, working to keep it covered up to keep the veil, and then building layers, and then building walls behind the layers of the veil. And a lot of times for good reason. A lot of times people are kind of uh, um, building this bomb shelter of protection to their human heart because why? Because their human heart's been damaged. They trusted someone, they were betrayed. Innocence was violated. Maybe their reputation was kind of chipped away, damaged, dented, destroyed. And so, rightly so, the human heart can be a complex network of walls, veils, curtains. And really, this is what's described to us in Scripture, that that the human heart has layers and depth. Did you know that in the Scripture, God says that the human heart is like roots? Where are the roots? Except for one tree that I'm aware of, the roots are deep in the ground, unhidden, uh, hidden, right? unseen, and also that the heart is like deep waters under the surface, flowing like a river, uh, kind of deeply feeding the roots so that's even lower. And then Jesus teaches that the heart is like a human treasure that's buried. So here we see Scripture, and God's telling us what we need to know about the heart, and here's how we start. It's complex. It is... um, really, really difficult to understand, except he says through the prophet Jeremiah that the human heart, you can count on this, is deceitful. You've heard this, right? You probably, if you're raising kids, you probably quote this every day about what, you're, what they're dealing with, that the human heart is deceitful, and actually he uses the phrase des- uh, desperately wicked. That sounds extra bad, doesn't it? That's just not like small, that's like biggie size bad. That is desperately wicked. It is deceitful. In fact, one version of the Scriptures, one translation says, above all things, it's, it's wicked and deceitful. And so, um, this helps us better understand why a lot of us instinctively prefer to hide. We prefer to kind of keep our unattractive thoughts and our ugly feelings covered up. We prefer not to um, kind of get it out there or let it out there for people to see or know. But when we are willing to be a little bit more vulnerable, when we are, are, are willing to let others handle our hearts with care because we trust them, here's what we discover. We discover that every heart is loving in the process of loving something. There is something somewhere in every human's life that is being loved by their heart. Look what Jesus says about it. Wherever your treasure is, what are you going to find? You're going to find their desires. The desires of the heart and the treasure are one and the same. They're interconnected. They're very similar to each other. That very thing that someone desires, they want. And it's natural, the natural desires of your heart. I want what I love and I love what I want. That's the principle that we discover. When we get into someone's life and when we get into someone's heart, when we kind of dig down there, here's what we're going to discover, that everybody's heart is loving something that they want, something that they desire, something that they need. We like to use the word affection, something that they have a love for, right? Think of an infant when the infant first starts to taste sweet stuff. And then all of a sudden... They start seeing it, right? And the tongue comes darting out, and you could see them kind of get ready because here comes another lick of the ice cream cone or another little shot of uh, um, chocolate syrup or a little lollipop or whatever the infant's discovering, and, and they light up because now they realize they really want it. They really like it. It's a natural desire. I've yet in all my years never heard anybody say, I tried to give my infant something really, really sweet and they gagged on it. I've never heard that ever. I've only heard and seen, there's actually a kind of a viral uh, meme going around of a little baby that tried soft ice cream for the first time. Maybe some of you have seen this. And it was like, 
they just, it was like they exploded with excitement and then they grabbed it with two hands and pulled it to their face. You ever see that? I live like that. I actually, that's how I live. Uh, ice cream. Never outgrew it. But I want you to think of that picture when you think of what's happening in our hearts. The things that we want, the things that we need, the things that we desire, our hearts are leaping for it like an infant towards anything sweet. Just, it's just a desire. It's a craving that's happening in our hearts. And it's in our hearts where we store the things that are most important to us. We put them on the inside. We hold on to them in the container called the heart. It's where we put the most important things that we have or that we want. If we want rest and health for our bodies, that desire gets stored in our heart. If we want peace and love on the inside, we want to be loved, we want to love someone, we want peace on the inside, we store that in our hearts. It's resting in there. If we want the absolute best for our kids... If we want the absolute best for our family, if we want the absolute best for our friends, if we want the absolute best for anybody, if we want protection from our perceived enemies or our real enemies, if we uh, um, want meaningful work, if we want a significant life and want to make a difference in the world, all of those things that we want and desire, you know where they're stored? In the heart. They are down there somewhere. They might be layer one, two, or three, but they're down there somewhere. But when we turn to them for help. When we turn to those things that we desire for help more than we turn to God, there's a phrase for that. It's called a functional Savior. Let me say that again. When we turn to those things that bring us comfort and happiness and joy, and we turn to them for happiness, comfort, and joy more than we turn to the God who created us, it's called a functional Savior. They're helping us save our negative feelings. They're helping us save our disappointments or save us from somehow... um, feeling one way or other. Now, to help make your way down, if you want to kind of dig into your heart, and I know most of you are probably like, no thanks, I'm good. I just, I'm just leave it the way it is. It's all veiled up and stuffed away for a reason. But if you wanted to kind of dig into your heart, because most of us don't really know the depths of our heart until we start asking ourselves some real questions. So there's some diagnostic questions that will help you kind of take some steps to kind of get down into the lower basement area of our, of our heart And you might do some mining of the soul, and what you'll discover is there's some idols that are kind of taken up residence down in our heart. Our idols of comfort, approval, control, power, those are four big summary idols. But you ask yourself these questions. If you want to discover if there's any idols kind of teeming around down in your heart, you might ask yourself a question like this. You might say, what could I never, ever be able to live without? I just couldn't live without it. If I lost it, I don't know how I would continue because if I lost it, it would ruin my life. You might, it might be physical health. It might be friends, family, loved ones, spouse. Um, uh, who knows? I mean, it could be limitless things. If Gannon's closed, I mean, I don't know how I would continue. I mean, things like that. You know what I mean? You don't. What would make me truly... You might ask this. What would make me truly happy? If I had this, I wouldn't be sad anymore. If I had this, then I could finally relax and I could finally be content. I could finally just settle down and be happy. If only I had this blank. And for the sake of time, I'm not filling those blanks in with some ideas. I mean, just let the Holy Spirit help you when you're digging through your heart. Or what do I fear the most? What is, what is the worst nightmare of my life? Something that I just, in, in, in vigorous way, try to hope and pray to avoid. I could never deal with it if this happened. There's all different ways to do this, but what you're doing is you're digging up when you ask those questions. What are the things that you love? What are the things that you treasure? And what are the things that you trust? Now, when we love, treasure, and trust those things more than we do God, it's called an idol, something that we are willing to make sacrifices to keep, something that we're willing to make sacrifices to elevate, something that we're willing to sacrifice uh, in order to maintain. That's why you see people doing crazy things when they're estranged from their spouse and there's killings and robberies and hitmen and setups. And I watch that stuff and I go, how does someone get to that point where they're like, I just had an idea. I'm going to call a hitman. Right? How does someone get there? The answer is, 
there is something that they treasure, love, that there is something that is driving their existence that is forcing them to make sacrifices to get it. Terrible sacrifices, painful sacrifices. So, don't forget, we come back to what Jesus says. Wherever your treasure is, there is the desires of your heart. Now, let me warn you, because it's even worse down there in that heart. It's even worse. There's even more going on down there than um, treasuring something too much. Whatever we treasure is the source of life-altering temptation. Temptation is at work, is kind of stirring around in our heart, and it comes from within us. Now, keep this in mind. Our greatest temptations come not from outside of us, but it's at work, in, it's, it's at work inside of us. This is something that's uniquely Christian. It is distinctly Christian to believe that our greatest uh, um, turmoil is not being perpetuated on us or perpetrated on us. It's not being, we're not being attacked primarily by the biggest temptation in our life or trouble in our life, but instead, it's actually coming from within. Look how it's taught here in James. Temptation comes from our own desires, our own wants, our own needs, our own affections, our own loves, which entice us and drag us away to hire hitmen or something. I mean, that's what I'm saying. These desires give birth to sinful actions. Where do the sinful actions come from, everybody, according to this? Sinful desires. Where are the desires? Are they coming from the outside? Are they coming from society? Are they coming from culture? Are they coming from civilization? Are they coming from our relatives? Is it coming from our spouse? These types of desires, these types of temptation are coming from within. They give birth to sinful actions. And when we sin, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth, it leads us somewhere, it gives birth to separation from God. Idolatry, rebellion. So when we want to practice... Um, we, what we want to practice is on our own, in our own selves, we want to grow in our transparency with God. We want to find a way to be more honest with God. And you know that God invites us, and we see this show up in several places in the Psalms, but God invites us to be transparent about what's happening in our hearts. He invites us to ask these difficult questions about what I love, serve, want, what I desire, what am I making sacrifices to have? And in the Psalms, he says, oh, my people, my people who have all kinds of things at war in their own hearts, trust in me at all times. Pour out your heart to me, for I am your refuge. I protect you. I am where you hide your life. You remember that passage where God is described as, as, as one whose wings cast a shadow and you come within the, the cover of his wings inside the shadow of the Almighty and you find rest there and protection there. And here's what we're learning, that the place to go with the stuff that's going on in your heart is to the Father in heaven. And then, by the way, when we learn that kind of transparency... We see how it works. We share the pleasures and pains of our lives with a God who cherishes hearing our pleasures and our pains, and He shares them with us. He hears us in the fullest sense. He's listening. He knows suffering. He's, he's suffered more than any of us could ever imagine suffering, and God is moved to action. And then as our response to having this transparent relationship with God, you know what we do? We can kind of help other people. We can help them kind of dig down below the surface. We can say, you know what? For years and years and years, you don't have to say this, but you could think this thought. Like for years and years and years, I've been surface small talk with my coworker, my spouse, my kids, my parents, whatever. I, I, I want to help. Something's going on. Trouble's brewing. I want to help. And you start to kind of walk your way down into uh, transparency, started to get into the heart. Where? We listen to people. We listen to them more clearly. And we listen for the matters that are most important to them. We listen to the things that they speak of uh, um, that seem to be the things that they, they treasure. And as we grow in our understanding of our, how our heart works, we kind of learn to move more deeply into someone else's life. And uh, in my house, sometimes this looks like sitting around the dinner table and dad is so um, um, kind of tired or, or maybe even, um, I, I'm not 
really um, comfortable keeping it on the surface at dinner. We're going to go a little deeper. We're going to go around the table. We're going to talk a little bit more deeply about what uh, um, dad's going to take it deeper with the family. You know what I'm talking about? And I always get the same reaction. Oh, here we go. Oh, God. And I always say to my wife, that's a bad example. You're setting a bad example for all the kids. Right? There's always a little eye roll as we kind of think about, here comes some questions. Here comes some, you know, I have a friend who told me that every day uh, um, that they sit at the dinner table, he asks his kids, every day, if they're not having dinner, he asks his kids when they get home from school, same thing every day. Hey, two things. Today's highlight, today's low light. Go, tell me, tell me about it. What's your highlight, what's your low light? And he said, I'm not listening for the details. I'm not listening for the events. I'm not listening, oh, we went to gym class. and It's the same thing every time. Instead, he said, I'm listening. I'm listening for something that comes up below the surface that emits a strong emotion or a fear or a frustration. In other words, highlights and lowlights low, low lights are demonstrating what's important. In fact, he says to me, sometimes it's just the topic that I notice that they start out with. But if we want to help somebody, this is, my, this is kind of what I'm building towards. If we want to help somebody, we have to, we have to consider this, that their heart is complex, right? We, we know that there is uh, um, things that they adore, that there is temptation. And we also recognize that at the heart level, conversations, there's joy there. There's joy in our conversations that are available. These conversations are essential if we really want to help somebody, if we really want to care for somebody, if we really want to encourage somebody, we're going to have to find our way down into a heart that's a little bit more transparent. When Jesus teaches about the heart, you know what he says? He kind of teaches with this agricultural, um, uh, um, he, 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 he teaches with this agricultural metaphor, and what he basically says is that a heart is kind of like a tree. And he teaches us about our hearts here, and here's what he says, every heart is producing something. Every heart is producing something like a tree does. And here's what he goes on to teach. He says that if you think about a tree, right, this certain kind of tree, if it's a fig tree, it can only produce figs, right? A fig tree doesn't produce some other kind of, a thorn bush doesn't produce figs, right? And so what he's saying here is this. A good person produces good things from where? The treasury of a good heart. We see this word treasure again. From down inside, you see good things. Where's it coming from? Good behaviors aren't coming from good, willful decisions that the mind just kind of instinctively makes. It's coming from a reservoir. A good heart makes those decisions. An evil person is producing evil things. Where? From the treasury of an evil heart. And what you say, this is kind of like what Jesus kind of, how he kind of wraps this up here, this this small little text. And he says, here's an example. The things that you hear people saying, the things that are coming out of your mouth, it's not coming out of your mouth. It's not just coming out of your, your brain. It's spilling over from what's being held in treasure on the inside. And that's why I think that some of the teaching that we see in the Scripture is that the words that people use matter because they're not typically just like... Now, I will say, if you tend to be a sarcastic person, I'm going to to soothe myself a little bit. Sometimes you've never thought ever of what's come out of your mouth, right? It's just a quick little jokey joke. Sarcastic people, are you with me? This does not apply to us. Okay, can we, can, we, can we be honest? Let's be honest. This is, Jesus was not teaching sarcastic people. I remember saying something one time sarcastically. I also learned this. When I went from the Northeast, where like the only words that my friends and I ever said to anyone ever was sarcasm. That's it. It was terribly painful to anybody who wasn't from the Northeast, and maybe even from the Northeast. But I went to school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you know what? We tried sarcasm. And, and, and we, we, I mean, I had already, I went down with a friend of mine named Russ, and I had already said, Russ, I'm not sure this is going to work because I don't think people are going to think it's funny, especially since they don't know us. Well, he proved the theory by turning to somebody who dressed like a Mennonite, and she put her, her ankle over her ankle at chapel, and he says, um, says her name. And now that Facebook is around, I can't say names from 30 years ago, you know what I mean? So he says her name, and he says, I, I, I find it a little immodest there that you're uh, showing off your ankle socks. 
Now that's funny, right? Isn't it funny? Do you get it? Do you get it? She's dressed like a Mennonite or a womanite. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it now. Is that how do you do it? All right. A Hittite, Jebusite, I don't know. Womenite. So he makes a comment on her ankle socks, and I'm thinking, that's actually pretty funny because obviously she's covered head to toe. There's like this little glimpse of her ankle socks. Well, she didn't think it was that funny. She stands up, snaps her chair back. It's, a, it's one of those chairs that goes, wah, bah, 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 bah. and she just, ab, just flies out of the room and storms away. And, and Russ and I have this heart-to-heart conversation. And we have to commit ourselves, okay, we, we, I can't give up sarcasm. Can you? Not a chance. All right, so how are we going to do this? And what we decided was to aim sarcasm at a thing or aim sarcasm at ourself, but don't aim it at people, Right? So then I also know people who use sarcasm to tell the truth. They're trying to think of a way to tell somebody something, and the way that they do it is a sarcastic joke. And here's what they're hoping. They hope they get it. They hope they figure it out, right? So if, can you imagine the confusion of somebody being sarcastic? Are you, are you telling me the truth? Is this not the truth? Here's, here's what I think we have to take inventory. We have to take inventory that oftentimes, oftentimes, unless you're wildly, spontaneously humorous, and these things are just coming to you sarcastically, there is some truth that's loading up our words, and it's coming out of our heart. Loading up our words. And that's why our words don't hit like pinpricks. They hit like anvils to people. Jesus is teaching this, that the stuff that's coming out of our mouth, the behavior that's happening on the surface, it's coming from the treasury the things that we desire, want, the fears, the frustrations that are happening in our heart. And Jesus says that it's true. And here in our hearts is where we find that people can be upright or they can be duplicitous. They can be hypocritical. They can be kind and gentle, steadfast, clean, penitent. They can be pure. Or in their heart, they can have all kinds of wicked, selfish ambition, overflowing with folly, A basic principle operates here and one that applies in the spiritual world just the way that it it, it applies in the agricultural uh, world. Now, the glaring behavior that you see on the surface is produced by what's growing below the surface. So when you're helping somebody, serving somebody, loving somebody, caring for somebody, someone who uh, you have some level of respect and appreciation for, someone that you want to help, You cannot forget this, that whatever it is that you're seeing on the surface is being produced by something that's going on below the surface. It's under there somewhere, and we cannot, we have to be very, very careful that we're not only ever dealing with somebody's surface behaviors, right? And if you're married or you're raising kids, you know this is is true. So, and then he added, it's what comes from inside that defiles you from within, For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, uh, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defiles you. So the terrible stuff that's going on on the surface of somebody's life means that there are roots that are on the inside that are producing that behavior. Parents, friends, if you're a counselor... If you're a caregiver or a spouse, and and it's going to help you to love somebody when you recognize that what you're seeing, the behavior on the surface, you're probably going to have to look past to get to the source of the issue. You're probably going to have to, oh, you could do this. Let the surface behaviors be the symptom and the catalyst and the trigger that helps you know something's going on. And now, again, I, I know I say this uh, probably uh, maybe even too much for those of you who don't have kids, but if you have kids, you're, you're, you already know this, right? You're looking at those cues. Something on the surface is triggering you, triggering you. Something's going on. Something's happening below the surface. I remember when I was disciplining our oldest child. She was a toddler, and I went in, and I, I did what every toddler needs, which is they need to hear their father quote the book of Proverbs. So I left this with her. And I said, I said, Kaylee, there is foolishness. God God tells us that there's foolishness that's bound up. It's trapped inside your heart. And it's daddy's job and mommy's job to help drive that out. 
And she started scraping her chest, and she looked me in the face, and she said, no, there's not. I said, you're grounded forever. No relief. And inside this little heart, the the proverb says that there's foolishness that's bound up there, and eventually foolishness, sinfulness in the treasure of your heart leads to all these terrible things. Terrible trouble in somebody's life comes from inside. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you need a new life, if you need a new outlook, if you need a new attitude, if you need new circumstances in some cases, not all, but in some cases, it begins, it starts, the source, the bottom is receiving a new heart from the creator who gave you the heart that you have in the first place. And the scripture teaches us that there's an exchange that happens when our hearts are regenerated by believing and receiving, resting our trust in Jesus. And God miraculously by the work of this thing called the Holy Spirit, this beautiful person who is fully God is at work on the inside and takes this stony, prideful, ugly heart out and replaces this heart uh, uh, and and puts in, in its place a heart of flesh who is now tender and sensitive to the creator who's at work. A heart transplant is needed for any real life change or real lasting change. And only God can work to bring a new heart. Only God can work over time to bring a clean heart. Only God could replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And any time that we're at work trying to help people, even if, it's, even if it's just trying to kind of prioritize their lives and think through new values and maybe do some better time management, all that stuff is important. But ultimately, can you see what, what, we're, what we're discovering together? That anybody who's dealing with deceit and lust and envy, slander, flu, all kinds of chaos in their life, most naturally, it isn't coming from the outside. It's not an attack coming from the outside. Most naturally, it's something, there's turmoil on the inside. And it's so valuable and so vital to be aware that our hope doesn't lie in the latest and greatest top 10 best-selling book. Although helpful isn't necessarily the healing and the transformation that God offers under the surface. He offers that desperately for you. Okay, last, real quick. Every heart is adoring someone, right? Every heart is adoring someone. This is the other thing that God reveals to us in Scripture about our hearts that you'll notice here that I didn't say adoring something. We did that at the beginning. Every heart is loving something. But every heart is adoring someone. That means worshiping. That means finding purpose and value. That means aspiring supreme value and worth. And it's someone that is being adored. Someone specific that is being worshipped. Check this out. Yes, they knew God. Paul writes here in Romans but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. So they're alert to God. They're aware of God. These are people that are not yet, um, these are kind of pagan outside the, the faith, or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. So here's God. He's a person. He's real. He's revealed himself to them in creation. He's, he's given them a conscience. And yet they didn't turn to God and they didn't adore God. Instead, they started to kind of make up their own gods. I think he's kind of like, you know, he's in the stars and he's in the, you know, he's in the, um, one of my favorite conversations that I have with people is when they find out I'm a minister and then they start to tell me their understanding of who God is. And I always think to myself, that's got to be a really, um, I don't know what's firing in someone's mind. It's, it's like someone saying to me, so I'm a, um, I work for NASA. You know, imagine I'm sitting on a plane, someone says I work for NASA. I'm an um, aeronautics engineer. I actually am a um, uh, um, uh, meta, I, I work in metaphysics, and I start going, you know what I think the composite elements of the, the planets are? Y- y- can I tell you what I think they are? And one of the things I've always known, I mean, how crazy is it? It's not to say that people can't understand God and then they talk to a minister, but I always think it's a strange reaction to say, oh, you're a minister? I'm going to tell you what I've always imagined that God is and then come up with every different kind of thing they've ever seen, and then they always finish this way. And in the words of Oprah, no, I'm kidding, they don't ever say that. So they think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and here's why. Because, I want you to catch this, here's why. It's because they don't love the Creator. Their heart doesn't adore the Creator, they adore themselves. 
and they've created a God that serves them. They created a God that serves them. Now, listen, we all do this all the time until God displaces and replaces this in our hearts and in our minds through, because we we're, we're tend to be idolater, uh, uh, idolaters. When we all live before God. We all live before the person of God. Whether we are cons- conscious of it or not, we're living before God. And He pursues us. He invites us to know Him through Jesus And what's on his heart is that we would get to know him. We would live in worship with him. We would adore him. And through Jesus, we would have this new desire to walk with Jesus, serve Jesus, adore Jesus, to kind of live on mission with Jesus, to speak with Jesus in prayer, that that's what God's always inviting us to. But instead, what he discovers is human beings who he calls spiritual adulterers. All through the Old Testament, minor prophets, God keeps telling his people, you're adulterers. I am your first love, I'm who you belong to, and I gave you the law, and it's not about following the law, it's about submitting in obedience to the lawgiver, right? When our kids are disobedient, we're not necessarily all that amped up about they broke the rule. What it demonstrates is a lack of trust for the rule giver, the rule maker. Our selfish desires, um, kind of as spiritual adulterers, our selfish, our selfish uh, uh, desires means that we adore things that God has created, other gods and other kingdoms that we think are more valuable or somehow they become more important to us. And the direction of our hearts is never only about keeping or breaking the law, it's about adoring the law giver. Check this out. In the very depths of our heart, it is not so much what we love, but who we love. It's not what we love. God isn't measuring what we love except to discover who we love. And we're either living for ourselves because we love ourselves, living for our own glory, or we love God and we live for him. And by the way, do you remember when Jesus says, it's those who love me who do what? What do those who love me do? If, you're, if you've, maybe you've studied this or, or you've been around the Christian faith long enough, right? Those who love me, they obey me. How do I know someone loves me? They're obedient. And by the way, that has to do with affection of the heart. It has to do with adoration of the heart. We either turn our heart towards God himself by being obedient, or we, uh, um, we ignore it. We let our heart ignore him and kind of go ahead and do our own thing and live for ourselves and live on our own. So how can we move more deeply into someone's life? Knowing this about the heart, knowing that our heart always loves something, our heart is always adoring someone, knowing that it always produces something, how can we move more deeply into someone's life? Well, one way is to ask questions and then be careful that you're not only listening for details of the events that they've experienced. Instead, after you ask questions, follow the strongest emotions. Follow the things that get, stir up the most emotion, right? Events, details, that kind of surfacey, small talky information isn't going to give you much. But the way into the heart is to be listening for joys and sorrows. Just recently I started to discover some things about myself because I don't, I don't know what the reason is. Well, maybe I know what the reason is. I don't know exactly what the reason is. Over the last... Several weeks, I've gotten so weepy. Isn't that? And things that normally just kind of are a surfacey, eh, regular old run-of-the-mill life, I have found myself so moved emotionally. And, and, and I, I, I know that my affection for the people in, in our church family and in my own family and my, my friends and whatever... That has always weighed heavy on me and moved me. But, you know, recently, people I barely know are telling me about their diagnosis, stage four. I got to go back for my third surgery, and we're hoping this, that, the other thing. And all of a sudden, it's like, my eyes are getting all full of tears. I'm like, what is going on? And here's what I think I'm discovering. I think I'm discovering that I have been worn down by a year of turmoil, and Uh, Maybe not worn down is the right way, but it's, oh, I could say it this way. All the stuff is just coming to the surface now. All the stuff is coming to the surface. And I think that it's 
telling me something to listen to my emotions. It's telling me something. The things that you all have experienced, the things that the people you love have experienced this past year, the things that I have experienced this past year, is not normal. It's in addition to all the regular suffering and hardship of life. And we should be listening. If you want to help somebody, listen to their strong emotions. We listen for their hopes and fears, and we take an interest in those things. That's how we start to build down below the surface of someone's life. Secondly, notice, affirm, and enjoy the good fruit that's showing. When someone's life is bearing good fruit, you've got kids and the fruit is showing. They're bearing fruit. You've got a spouse that's bearing fruit. You've got, uh, uh, you're making disciples and they're bearing fruit. Someone that you're serving with or serving under or, or, or someone you're working for or working with and you see this good fruit come up in their lives, notice it, affirm it, and enjoy it together. Some of you write cards. You're good at this. Write cards. Instead of just writing stream of consciousness, think to yourself, is there some fruitfulness in their life that I could affirm, I could notice, pay attention to, and thank God? them for letting God work in them, right? And so you're kind of digging past the surface by noticing that something good is happening under the surface because there's good fruit on top of the surface, above the surface. And you know, wouldn't it be true that most people respond when they discover someone genuinely likes them, right? I mean, I think there's power in these words. I like being around you. I mean, I haven't said that in 10 years, but I like being around you. I think, people, I think people are strengthened by that, aren't they? I think more people be more transparent when you just say, I just like who you are. I don't need you to do something for me. I don't like that you are doing for something that necessarily, that's not why I like you. I just like you for who you are. I heard one parent say that uh, they, God had put it on their heart to tell their kids, I love you, and let me tell you why. It isn't because you are a good student. It isn't because you're a great athlete. It isn't because you're succeeding in dance and in karate and in uh, uh, Little League. And That's not why I love you. I don't love you uh, because you're doing good things. I'm not going to love you less because you do bad things. I love you because you belong to me. And on top of that, I like you. Isn't that simple? Isn't that simple to kind of dig below the surface by just telling somebody that you like who they are? And lastly, see what's happening below the surface. Be patient with people in their weakness. Be, pa- be patient. Uh, I'm teaching my son Caleb to drive, and, and, um, and he had a really tense moment, and he's yielding, and he's got to move over three lanes. He's got about 100 yards to do it. It's a treacherous part. And um, he comes up around the corner and he starts to move over too soon. And this woman absolutely lost her ever-loving mind. Lays on the horn. She's swerving behind him. She's got like, and listen, she goes around him and races up to the red light, which is 50 yards in front of us. So now we get to go side by side with her and with us. So you know what I did, right? I leaned back in the passenger seat so she could see the kid that's driving. She's shaking her head like this. And I always, I'm teaching my kids this. Don't look. Don't make eye contact because you don't want to get shot in the face. Okay? So don't make eye contact. There was a day, back in the day, I might say to my kid, look, we always carry a bat. It's in the trunk. I don't say that anymore. Now we just say, just don't look in their face. But I think, you know, I think there's some wisdom in this. Here's some wisdom. It's very possible that whoever that was has something going on below the surface and it's crisis. It's loss. It's brokenness. It's fear. It is terrorizing their life. And you know what? If I'm the one they've got to lose their ever-loving mind over by beeping their horn at me, I'm going to take it. I'm all right with that. It's better than being shot in the face. I'll take it. But this also means that when we're caring for people, we're able to think beyond what we're seeing on the surface to know something's going on underneath the surface. And I want to love that person not because they're behaving well, but because they're broken underneath. And I might be able to help. So could I ask you to do something, church family? Could you be patient with people? Would you extend grace to people? Would you show mercy to people? 
And would you factor in the struggle that they might be dealing with? Their heart is trusting lies. Their life is potentially believing the false promises of sin. And as a result of that, they could be, instead of trusting the Word of God, they could be worshiping something or someone that's collapsing in on them now. Instead of worshiping and desiring and treasuring the things of earth more than we treasure God, and this idolatry is collapsing in on them. The reason why we don't hold things up that isn't God is because eventually that thing collapses in on us. And it creates all kinds of crisis. The church family, here's what I want to ask you to consider. When we're helping people, we've got to get past the surface, right? We've got to understand that there's something more important going on under the surface. And I want to just implore you to be affectionate. Could we be a church family who is transparently turning towards each other? And we're speaking in terms of heart condition, not in terms of behavior condition. Not just events and details, but so that we can know other people and we can be known ourselves and we let our guard down and we dig that heart out and say, here's what I'm bringing before God. Love that. And I believe it really would cultivate meaningful relationships. Let's pray together. Father, whatever it is, whatever it is that's stirring, crumbling, cracking under the surface. I pray today that you would bring newness of heart. If someone needs to trust you for the first time ever in their life instead of trusting themselves or trusting their stuff or trusting the idols that they've elevated in their life and they adore, I pray today that you would give them the wisdom, clarity to pray a prayer of repentance and renounce the thing that they're that they've rested their trust in and and instead repent of it and then take up a new life of rejoicing that you are the only God. You are the rescuing God. You are the life-saving God, soul-saving God. And I pray for the rest of us, God, that you'd give us the wisdom to move beyond the surface, get down into the heart, and to be transparent with you, to understand where our temptation and trouble comes from and wise wisely.